Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. My name is Ken Mayer. I'm one of the editors-in-chief of the Journal of the International Aid Society. On behalf of my other editor-in-chief, Dr. Annette Sun um, of Treat Asia and AMFAR, uh, I'm pleased to invite you to participate today in this JIS Symposium on Global Mental Health and HIV Prevention and Care. I first just want to uh, thank uh, the editorial staff of JIS for their hard work uh, working with our guest editors, and we're very fortunate to have a distinguished group of guest editors to address this extremely important topic. I'm going to turn the podium over uh, to my dear colleague, uh, um, Dr. Robert R um, R um, Remian, who is a professor of clinical psychology in the Department of Psychiatry at Columbia University and the director of the Center for Clinical and Behavioral Studies at Columbia. Bob, please take it away. Thank you very much, Ken, and, and greetings uh, to everyone. Good evening, good afternoon, good morning, depending where you are in the world. Thank you so much for joining us today for a discussion of this very special issue of JIAS. Um, I am Bob Remian, as, as Ken said, and um, professor of clinical psychology. I'm based at Columbia University uh, Medical Center in New York. And um, let me have my colleagues that I was fortunate to work with as, as a guest, guest editor group. Um, I'll have my two colleagues, colleagues who are here introduce themselves. Uh, Melanie and Vikram, go ahead. Hello everyone, I'm Melanie Abbas, Professor of Global Mental Health. It's a huge pleasure to be here and to welcome you all to this event. Hi, good morning everyone. I'm Vikram Patel. I'm a Professor of Global Health at Harvard Medical School. Pleasure to be, have served on the, um, as a guest editor along with Rob uh, and Melanie. And then, of course, our fourth person was Dixon Chibanda, who is unable to join us today. Um, let me just say a few words about this special issue and why we did it, uh, why we put this together, and, and, and want to gratitude to the editors of the journal for inviting us to do this and for paying attention to this topic in the context of our efforts to end the HIV epidemic globally. Um, while we all know that remarkable biomedical progress has been made in HIV treatment and prevention over the past decades, uh, people living with HIV continue to be at heightened risk and experience higher rates of common mental health disorders, including depression, anxiety, and substance abuse, compared to the general population. We also know that mental health disorders are associated with poorer HIV outcomes across the HIV care continuum. With mental health disorders acting as significant barriers to HIV treatment, engagement, and adherence. Thus, many of us here believe that improved integration of mental health services into HIV programs will be essential to our global ending the epidemic goals. And while we know that much research has been conducted on the topic of, of mental health in high income countries, especially in the United States, where I come from, there continues to be a paucity of research in the intersection of HIV and mental health in low and middle income countries. Thus, this special issue of JIS focused on studies carry out, ca that were carried out in low middle income settings with a high HIV burden and among our key populations at greatest risk for HIV. Um, there were 10 papers uh, ultimately selected. Um, it was, it was, a lot was submitted and it was competitive to get in. So there were 10 papers that were included plus an editorial from the four of us. Um, the articles in this, in this supplement provide concrete examples of interventions and strategies to prevent HIV acquisition among people with mental health problems and challenges. Uh, two, factors associated with common mental disorders among young people and adults living with HIV. Three, we focused on linkage between mental health problems and other psychosocial factors with increased HIV risk. And four, interventions to improve mental health among people living with HIV. Taken together, the collection of articles in the supplement emphasizes the importance of integrating mental health care within a full range of HIV programs, from those which seek to reduce risk for acquiring HIV in vulnerable populations, to those which seek to improve mental health outcomes uh, among people living with HIV. So I'd now like to turn the, the floor back to uh, my good colleague, Melanie Abbas, to, um, to move on to introducing the, our speakers for today. Thanks very much, Bob. Um, and as I said, I'm Professor of Global Mental Health at King's College London. Um, and it's a huge pleasure for me to um, give a brief introduction to our speakers in the order with which they'll be presenting. So Terry Sen 
is Chief of the Psychosocial Comorbidities of HIV Prevention and Treatment Programme in the Division of AIDS Research at the US National Institute of Mental Health. Ethel Natapuli Mpungu is Senior Lecturer and Psychiatric Epidemiologist in the Department of Psychiatry at Makerere University College of Health Sciences. Jennifer Veloza is Postdoc Fellow in the Department of Global Health at the University of Washington. And Min Wen is doctoral student in the Department of Health Behaviour at UNC Gelling School of Global Health. So handing back over, I think now to Vikram um, for the introduction to the, to the videos of the presentations. Thank you. Well, actually, there's not much to say about the, uh, the videos other than these were pre-recorded. And I think the plan now is that we're going to uh, basically show these recordings in sequence. And then all the authors, uh, all the relevant authors uh, who are present in the panel will join the three of us guest editors and the moderator for a Q&A and a discussion. Is that right, to Rob and Melanie? I think that's yeah. the plan. Yeah, that's okay. Perfect. So perfect. I'm not sure who actually triggers the videos. Oh, they're already triggered. Okay. My name is Terry Sen, and I'm the Chief of the Psychosocial Comorbidities of HIV Prevention and Treatment Program in the Division of AIDS Research at the U.S. National Institute of Mental Health. I'm very pleased today to present on NIMH perspectives on mental health in HIV care. I'd like to thank the editors of the journal, the guest editors of this supplement, and the journal staff for organizing this important symposium. The NIMH Division of AIDS Research was very pleased to provide support for this supplement because of the critical importance of addressing mental health in the context of HIV prevention and care. This supplement closely aligns with our priorities, including the NIMH mission to transform the understanding and treatment of mental illness, the NIMH Division of AIDS Research mission to reduce the incidence of HIV and decrease the burden of living with HIV, and the NIMH Center for Global Mental Health Mission to improve the lives of people living with or at risk for mental illness in low resource settings worldwide. We know that mental health is an important consideration in its own right, as poor mental health negatively impacts quality of life. In the context of HIV, poor mental health is also associated with poorer HIV prevention and care outcomes. Thus, addressing mental health is a critical component of addressing the HIV epidemic. Our primary mission at NIMH is research focused and there are numerous research gaps in our understanding of how to best address mental health in HIV care. Here we have illustrated some of the gaps in mental health research among people living with HIV. We encourage a biopsychosocial approach that recognizes the interplay among biological, psychological, and social mechanisms. We also encourage researchers to leverage basic biological and behavioral science knowledge to develop efficacious interventions, and then test feasibility and strategies for scale-up and sustainment using rigorous implementation science methods, and in the process, gaining information about intervention targets that will feed back into our knowledge about biopsychosocial mechanisms. Here, I want to specifically focus on two of these research gaps, as they're critically important to ending the global HIV epidemic. First, the impact of interventions that simultaneously address multiple mental health disorders and psychosocial factors associated with HIV. And second, testing implementation strategies for scaling up and sustaining effective interventions. When considering interventions to address mental disorders in HIV prevention and treatment, there are two issues I wanna highlight. First, much of the research on mental health and HIV has focused on depression but we know that mental health dis other mental health disorders are often comorbid with HIV. Thus, we need to think about moving beyond a sole focus on depression treatment when addressing mental health in the context of HIV. Second, mental disorders in HIV do not exist in a vacuum. They are often accompanied by numerous other life challenges, including challenges accessing healthcare, relationship challenges, stigma and violence, substance use, and structural factors like poverty and food insecurity. We may need to consider and address one or more of these additional factors besides mental health to move the needle on HIV. Additional research is needed to determine which interventions best address these complex and interwoven challenges. 
I'd also like to focus on testing strategies for scaling up and sustaining effective mental health interventions, particularly in low resource settings. There are numerous potential strategies, and a few of them include task sharing, where interventions adapted through delivery by individuals with less advanced training, mHealth approaches, which use technology to deliver interventions more cost efficiently or in settings where transportation is a barrier, differentiated care approaches, where treatment intensity, frequency, or type is matched to an individual's needs, reducing costs of providing excess or inappropriate treatment, transdiagnostic interventions, which simultaneously address a range of mental health disorders rather than solely focusing on one disorder at a time, and integration of mental health and HIV services. Many countries already have platforms for providing HIV treatment, which could be leveraged to more efficiently and cost-effectively deliver mental health treatment as well. Once mental health interventions have been successfully scaled up, there are still questions around how to sustain these interventions. So despite research investments on the intersection of mental health and HIV, there are still many gaps. Thus, a continuing high priority for the NIMH Division of AIDS Research is to support global research on the intersection of mental health and HIV, which is urgently needed to help move us toward the 95-95-95 goals. I'd like to thank you for your time, and I look forward to the live panel discussion. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to briefly describe the findings of a systemic review of mental health interventions for persons living with HIV in low and middle income countries. Next slide. Mental health problems are one of the most pressing challenges faced by persons living with HIV AIDS in low and middle income countries today. These mental health problems have negative consequences, including reduced engagement in care, poor adherence to treatment and poor virus suppression, increasing the likelihood to transmit the HIV virus. One way to increase access to mental health interventions in low and middle income countries is to show clearly the effectiveness of these interventions and the mechanisms through which they achieve their effectiveness. Our review synthesized the literature on evaluated mental health interventions for persons living with HIV AIDS in low and middle income countries to examine the various intervention components that may moderate causal mechanisms and to explore their relationship to intervention effectiveness. Next slide, please. To achieve these objectives, we conducted a search of electronic databases for eligible studies through August 2020. Two reviewers independent screened references in two successive stages. Stage one was the title and abstract screening. Stage two was the full text screening for references meeting the title and abstract criteria. We obtained 30 eligible studies involving almost 6,500 persons living with HIV AIDS. Next slide, please. We conducted a narrative synthesis following uh, these established guidelines. At first, we adopted the theory of change framework to guide the synthesis. The theory of change takes into account multiple causal pathways. Second, we used a standardized data extraction tool to obtain data on various study characteristics, including location of the study, uh, specifically the country, income category of that country, study sample size, mean age of participants, gender of the study participants, duration of follow-up, type of mental health intervention, study design, and the mental health problem targeted. These characteristics were tabulated. Then uh, we, we, these studies were clustered according to the characteristics in the data extraction tables, such as the type of mental health intervention, uh, targeted mental health problem, um, the setting, gender, and the delivery format, uh, that is individual versus group approach, and then the intervention effects, uh, whether they were significant or non-significant. 
We then assess the re relationships between the various study clusters and intervention effectiveness. Uh, specifically, we assessed the relationships between the various study clusters and intervention. Um, Specifically, we assessed relationships between intervention type, intervention deliverers, caseload, treatment adherence, a number of intervention active ingredients and the intervention effectiveness. And lastly, we examined the robustness of the synthesis by assessing the methodological rigor uh, of each study using the effective public health practice project quality assessment tool. Next slide, please. In our results, we found that uh, most of the studies were from the African region. Uh, however, the majority were from uh, lower middle or upper middle, middle countries and very few, only 5% were in lower income countries. Uh, the majority were individual randomized control trials. Uh, the majority of studies included both males and females. Uh, the average age of the study participants were 34 years. Um, and the majority of these interventions were psychological interventions. Um, the majority had a short term follow up, less than six months, and only 56% uh, reported significant intervention effects. Next slide, please. When we assess the relationships between the various uh, intervention components and intervention effectiveness, this is what we found. Uh, we found that um, interventions which included um, expression of personal problems, which we also refer to as venting, uh, social support, uh, positive coping skills, uh, cognitive restructuring, and behavior activation were more likely to report significant intervention effects uh, compared to uh, mental health interventions which did not have these particular active ingredients. Uh, also, we found that uh, studies that reported uh, significant intervention effects had a much lower caseload uh, therapist, and uh, also they were more likely to involve uh, public. They are more likely to report uh, public involvement, and also to report uh, supervision of the health workers who delivered these interventions. Next slide, please. In conclusion, we learned from this review that common mental health problems in adults living with HIV AIDS are, am are amenable to psychological treatments. And our results also, also show that the active ingredients of these mental health interventions may be critical for intervention effectiveness. More research is needed to elucidate how intervention components lead to intervention effectiveness and the scale up of culturally appropriate interventions that have been successfully evaluated in low and middle income countries is recommended. Thank you very much to the symposium organizers for the invitation to present on considerations around global mental health and HIV prevention. My name is Jen Veloza and I'm a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Washington. Today I'll tell you a little bit about our recent publication exploring patterns of depressive symptoms and the influence of symptom trajectories on the use of HIV pre-exposure prophylaxis, or PrEP, among adolescent girls and young women. As you likely already know, there's an incredibly high burden of HIV in Africa, particularly in Sub-Saharan Africa, where approximately 800,000 new HIV infections occurred in 2019. In this region, adolescent girls and young women represented here in the dark blue circle comprise the majority of new HIV infections, as compared with other regions where different key populations are more vulnerable. HIV pre-exposure prophylaxis, or PrEP, is a highly effective biomedical HIV prevention strategy that's being scaled up for adolescent girls and young women in HIV endemic settings. 
In PrEP demonstration projects and real-world PrEP delivery programs, we see high initial PrEP uptake in this population, followed by sharp declines in adherence and persistence over time. Low PrEP adherence has been associated with complex biological, psychological, social, and neurocognitive factors, as depicted in this model developed by Claude Mellons. Mental health factors, including depression and post-traumatic stress, have been associated with low PrEP adherence among adult women and individuals living with HIV. And they may also be related to PrEP use for adolescent girls and young women. Adolescence is really a critical time for onset of depression and other common mental disorders. And these conditions can change dynamically over time, particularly among individuals who are engaged in HIV service delivery with regular testing, HIV focused counseling, and also opportunities for peer support. So we really need a more nuanced view of patterns of depressive symptoms among adolescent girls and young women who might be eligible for and seeking PrEP. In addition, little has been published about how depressive symptom patterns or trajectories could influence PrEP adherence in this younger population. This analysis sought to address these gaps. We conducted secondary analyses using data from the HPTN-082 study. HPTN-082 was conducted with 427 adolescent girls and young women between the ages of 16 to 25 years. And they were from Cape Town and Johannesburg, South Africa, and Harare, Zimbabwe. The study sought to determine the effect of a PrEP support package on PrEP adherence through one year of follow-up. Participants completed study visits for one year. Depressive symptoms were measured with the Center for Epidemiologic Studies or CESD screening tool at enrollment in weeks 13, 26, and 52. We also collected data on other factors, including intimate partner violence, traumatic stress symptoms, and sexual behavior and transactional sex at these same study visits. PrEP adherence was measured at weeks 13, 26, and 52 using tenofovir diphosphate, which is a biomarker of PrEP use in about a month prior to the sample collection. We used descriptive statistics to summarize CESD scores or depressive symptoms and PrEP adherence over time. But in addition to just describing CESD scores, we also wanted to understand patterns of depressive symptoms in this cohort. Group-based trajectory models really allowed us to estimate the proportion of a population who belong to different depressive symptom trajectories by calculating the posterior probability of an individual belonging to an assigned trajectory given their observed data. After we identified depressive symptom trajectories, we also looked at baseline predictors of trajectory membership and associations between trajectories and PrEP adherence at week 52 to see if different trajectories could differentially impact PrEP adherence. Of the 427 study participants in HBTN-082, 62% had CESD scores of at least 10, indicating elevated depressive symptoms. And about half reported at least one experience of intimate partner violence in the past year. Tenofovir diphosphate was detected at 58% of all follow-up visits. And high PrEP adherence, which we measured with a drug concentration threshold of 700 fentanyls per punch, was observed at 18% of visits. Our group-based trajectory models revealed three depressive symptom trajectories. Persistent elevated depressive symptoms among 48.5% of the population, consistent no or mild depressive symptoms in 43% of the population, and declining symptoms in 9.4% of the population. We did not identify any trajectory groups with increasing or recurring depressive symptoms in this cohort. When exploring associations between depressive symptom trajectory membership and high PrEP adherence, we found that being assigned to the persistent elevated depressive symptom trajectory group over here on the right was associated with significantly lower likelihood of having high PrEP adherence at week 52 compared with being in the consistent no or mild depressive symptom trajectory group over here on the left. Declining symptoms here in the middle were also associated with lower likelihood of having high PrEP adherence compared to no or mild symptoms again. In addition, we found that persistent depressive symptoms were associated with intimate partner violence, 
with 62% of those assigned to this trajectory also reporting IPV at enrollment, compared with 35% of those in the no or mild depressive symptom trajectory. And we found similar results for transactional sex and traumatic stress symptoms, with report of any transactional sex or report of a higher score on the post-traumatic stress disorder checklist for the DSM-5, the PCL-5, both being associated with being assigned to that persistent depressive symptom trajectory group. So in summary, we identified three distinct depressive symptom trajectory groups in this population, which included adolescent girls and young women who were initiating PrEP as part of an HIV prevention study in South Africa and Zimbabwe. These findings are largely consistent with other analyses of depressive symptom patterns among individuals either living with or at risk of HIV in both the United States and in South Africa. Notably, only 10% of our cohort had symptoms that changed over time. The rest were assigned to either the persistent high or the consistent low symptom trajectories. And we found that persistent depressive symptoms were associated with intimate partner violence, traumatic stress symptoms, and transactional sex at baseline. The associations that we observed between persistent depressive symptoms and lower PrEP adherence could be explained by a variety of possible mechanisms, including lower self-efficacy and possibly reduced motivations to engage with PrEP, social isolation and a lack of social support around pill taking, and changes in sexual behavior and perhaps also perceived PrEP need. Successful PrEP delivery to adolescent girls and young women really requires adolescent-friendly outreach activities, followed by risk assessment and understanding of their own risk perceptions, PrEP eligibility determinations, PrEP initiation, and then subsequent regular touch points for PrEP refills and repeated assessment and conversation around PrEP needs. Our findings really highlight the need to integrate depression assessment at PrEP initiation and potentially also at refill visits to identify adolescent girls and young women who could benefit from more intensive PrEP adherence counseling. PrEP programs could also screen for factors that we found to be related to persistent symptoms, including intimate partner violence, traumatic stress, and transactional sex, to identify young women who could need more intensive PrEP adherence support. Depression assessment at these PrEP visits also provides a unique opportunity to link adolescent girls and young women with mental health services while they're also receiving their HIV prevention support. And that has the potential to not only improve cost-effective PrEP delivery, but also mental health outcomes in this population. I'd like to close by acknowledging my colleagues, our funders, and the research participants who contributed to this body of research. This work would not have been possible without the entire HPTN OA2 study team in South Africa and Zimbabwe, as well as the team of collaborators at the University of Washington and FHI 360. Thank you very much, and I look forward to the panel discussion. Hello, everyone. My name is Min Nguyen, and I'm from the Department of Health Behavior at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, Gilling School of Global Public Health. It is my honor um, to attend the symposium today and present to you our research titled The Longitudinal Association Between Depression, Anxiety Symptoms and HIV Outcomes and the Modifying Effect of Alcohol Dependence Among uh, MTE Retroviral Therapy Clients with Hazardous Alcohol Use in Vietnam. So a little bit of the background behind this research. It is estimated that people with HIV had about 1.6 to four times higher the odds of having depression and anxiety compared to those without HIV. Moreover, between a quarter to almost half of people with HIV have hazardous alcohol use, which is defined as the quantity or pattern of alcohol consumption that can increase adverse health outcomes. So both mental health disorders and hazardous alcohol use are independently linked to poorer um, adherence to medication, lower likelihood of viral suppression, as well as higher mortality rates among people with HIV. The problem is depression, anxiety, and hazardous alcohol use often coexist among people with HIV. However, 
there was little research on the impacts of mental health symptoms on HIV outcomes among this particular group of people with HIV who also have hazardous alcohol use. And it's also not very clear if alcohol use interacts with this mental health symptoms to worsen the HIV outcomes. So our study is a secondary data analysis of Redart, which is um, the study uh, named Reducing Hazardous Alcohol Use in HIV Viral Load, a randomized controlled trial in antiretroviral therapy or ART clinics in Vietnam. So this is a three-arm randomized controlled trial that aimed to reduce alcohol use among people with HIV on ART in Thái Nguyen, Vietnam. So Vietnam is, is a country located in Southeast Asia and Thái Nguyen is the mountainous multi-ethnic um, province in the north of Vietnam where the rest are is. So this is the map of Thái Nguyen. So why did we conduct the study in Vietnam? It's because alcohol use and alcohol related problems are very common in this country, especially among men with about 40% of men classified as hazardous drinkers. So in the parent study, 441 HIV patients in seven ART clinics in Thái Nguyen were randomized to receive either a brief intervention, a combined intervention, um, or a standard of care. Um, so um, this, both of these interventions focused on reducing alcohol use among participants, and all participants um, had a follow-up visit at three months, six months, and 12 months after receiving the intervention. Inclusion criteria of the study included um, being a current client on ART at one of the seven clinics, uh, classified as having hazardous alcohol use based on the RDC scale, um, being 18 years of age or older, and staying in Thái Nguyen for the next 24 months, uh, just for the sake of following, being followed up. And patients were excluded from the study if they were unable to provide informed consent due to different reasons, unwilling to provide contact information, or currently participating in other HIV or alcohol use studies. Here are some key variables that were measured in the parent study. So apart from social demographic characteristic, we also collected data on mental health symptoms. So with depression symptoms, we used the patient health questionnaire nine, and with anxiety symptoms, we use the generalized anxiety disorder seven. Um, as for alcohol use, because all participants um, were classified as hazardous drinker at the uh, at enrollment, we evaluated whether they had alcohol dependence, or, which is a higher level of alcohol use disorder, based on the mini international neuropsychiatric interview. Um, and for HIV outcomes, um, we evaluated whether they had virus suppression, which was defined as having less than 20 copies of HIV RNA per ml of blood, um, and whether they had complete ART adherence defined as not missing any pills in the last three months. So we use generalized estim estimating equations or GEE models um, to evaluate the longitudinal association between the exposure and the outcomes uh, and estimated um, risk ratio of virus suppression and ART adherence associated with a five unit change in mental health symptoms. And because the outcomes of virus suppression and adherence um, were pretty common in our sample, um, as um, I will show in the next slide, uh, we use Poisson regression with robust variance estimation. And interaction terms between mental health symptoms and alcohol dependence were included um, to assess whether alcohol dependence was a uh, um, significant effect modifier. And finally, um, we use multiple imputation to deal with missing data. 
first, I want to present some baseline characteristics of the sample. The mean age was 40.2 uh, years old, and the majority of the sample was male, married, employed, and had at least some secondary school education. Alcohol dependence was identified among 21.1% of participants. And depression and anxiety, anxiety symptoms, as you can see here, were very common at baseline with 25.1% having depression symptoms and 16.1% having anxiety symptoms. And at baseline, 84.1% were virally suppressed and 76.4% had complete ART adherence. So as you can see here um, on the right, um, the estimates in red, both depression symptoms and anxiety symptoms were associated with a lower probability of complete ART adherence. However, um, the symptoms had no overall effect on viral suppression, as you can see on the left. Uh, when we examine the role of alcohol dependence as an effect modifier, uh, we saw that it was a significant modifier of the association between anxiety symptoms and complete ART adherence, such that the negative effects of anxiety symptoms on adherence were stronger and more significant among those with alcohol dependence compared to those without. So you can see here at three months, um, both group, um, the, the association was significant with both group, but was stronger among those with alcohol dependence. And at, six, uh, at the six month visit, um, only those with alcohol dependence um, had a significant association between anxiety symptom and complete ART adherence. So what does this mean for future research? Um, first, you can see that um, improving mental health should be an important target of future interventions for those living with HIV, especially those with hazardous alcohol use. Um, moreover, um, we should um, incorporate mental health components into alcohol reduction intervention to simultaneously target these comorbidities. And next, uh, we should use um, task shifting models to take advantage of existing HIV care, especially in low resource settings. And finally, um, more implementation studies and cost effectiveness studies are needed to see if the scaling up of this intervention should, would be feasible and acceptable in low and mid middle income country. So that's the end of my presentation. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much to our presenters for those really excellent and thoughtful um, and succinct presentations. We're now going to break, begin our uh, panel discussion. So I'd ask the presenters, uh, our other um, editors, um, uh, and our colleagues from NIMH, Dr. Bowers, to uh, please turn on your videos. And we'll um, take some um, questions. And, and if folks want to continue to ask questions, my colleague, uh, Dr. Netson, is going to be um, uh, monitoring the chat so we'll be able to stay current. But just to start off with, um, I'd first like to uh, specifically introduce uh, Dr. Bowers, who's Deputy Director of the Division of AIDS Research at the National Institute of Mental Health. And he and his colleague, Dr. Diane Rausch, have really uh, been the inspiration for this uh, special issue, uh, providing the support for this. And we're very grateful to NIMH for, um, for their uh, sponsorship. So a question uh, for Terry, Dr. Bowers, and other members of the panel. Um, we have a diverse audience today, which is really wonderful from around the world, some people in training. And one question would be, what are training opportunities uh, for uh, um, global um, investigators who are interested in uh, becoming more expert in doing uh, uh, behavioral health research uh, uh, internationally? Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that question. Maybe I'll just uh, take a, a quick minute to mention a couple of different mechanisms that we have here at NIH that can support investigators, particularly investigators who are currently located in a low and middle income country. Um, so we have a K43 award, which is a career development award for junior faculty that combines uh, career development experiences plus a research project. 
And we also have a D43 mechanism, which is an institutional training award um, where there's a collaborative training opportunity between a US-based institution as well as an institution in a low and middle income country. And I can put my email in the chat and I'd be happy to talk with anyone further um, who might be interested in those mechanisms. Wonderful, thank you. I don't know if uh, Pim, um, do you have any additional um, comments to make about, about NIH uh, involvement in training? No, um, those are great mechanisms, and uh, I know that um, that a number of the uh, uh, people on the panel here actually have D43s, and uh, that they've been very productive and really been able to get a lot of uh, enthusiasm of new investigators in low middle income countries to kind of take up uh, mental health research. Uh, so, you know, and again, I you know I would say contact Terry or me. Um, if you uh, are interested, uh, and we can help you further. Great, thank you. Uh, other panelists, uh, any other um, um, mechanisms or other programs that uh, people on this uh, Zoom should be aware of? Well, the Wellcome Trust has a long-standing program for supporting uh, researchers from low and middle-income countries. It has a, a, a range of different fellowships, some of which are actually country-specific, but others which are from any low and middle-income country. And what's really interesting about their support is, in fact, you don't need a high-income country partner at all, which is sometimes often a condition of some of these uh, schemes. So it's well worth looking at the Wellcome Trust website as well. Great. Uh, thank you. So uh, one, one topic that came up, uh, several questions uh, for the panelists to think about is um, how do we unpack the issue of the relationship between behavioral health challenges and HIV acquisition? So what do we know about um, to the extent to which the behavioral health challenges uh, predispose towards HIV or to the extent to which uh, HIV diagnosis results in uh, behavioral health uh, uh, challenges? Anybody from the panel like to address that? I think for a long, long time, we've known that this is a bi-directional relationship um, so that um, mental disorders both increase risk of acquisition. And then once you have um, HIV, you have an increased risk of a number of psychological and behavioral challenges, whether those are actually disorders or changes in behavior, changes in, in thinking, uh, which can then um, increased vulnerability to a mental disorder. So just kicking us off with it with a thought there. Other comments that anybody would like to add? Yes, I would like to add uh, something. Um, way back, almost 15 years ago, we did uh, research on um, HIV-related mania. And uh, we were able to show that uh, persons with HIV AIDS uh, could get uh, mania related to the HIV virus. Uh, whereas also patients with uh, bipolar mania uh, uh, turned up with HIV infection in, in, in our um, hospitals. Uh, and we were able to show that uh, HIV-related mania is different from, from the uh, bipolar mania. For example, patients who came with HIV uh, mania, they, they would get severe extrapyramidal um, side effects. And their response to treatment was also different. So uh, we know that the HIV virus crosses the blood-brain barrier and the virus directly affects uh, the brain, uh, including those parts that regulate our emotions. Uh, but we also know that um, having the HIV together with its social and psychological stressors uh, that come with living with the diagnosis of HIV uh, precipitates uh, a range of uh, behavior and um, psychiatric problems ranging from acute stress reactions, adjustment disorders uh, to severe uh, mental health problems. Great, thank you. Any other comments uh, panels would like to make? Just a very general comment, Ken. I mean, it, it, my colleagues have already stated it, that there's a, a bi-directional, multi-directional nature of this phenomenon with the increased vulnerability to acquiring HIV, but then also the exacerbation of having HIV, interacting with someone who has prior mental health disorders. Um, some people can develop new mental disorders as a result of HIV, although a lot of people 
um, and I think Melanie hinted at this, just have distress and not necessarily disorder as a reaction to a diagnosis. But the other thing that was just brought in by the prior comments is that there's both a biological and sort of social or, or reactive phenomenon going on here. And, and I think there's still a lot of research is needed to really understand the underlying mechanisms of the interaction of HIV disease with, because it does cross the blood brain barrier and, um, and mental health uh, challenges and reactions as well as responses to treatment. So it's very complex and it's multi-layered. Very like complex. To say, Sorry. Yeah. No, I, I just want to say one more thing. You know, I think it is important to, to sort of, you know, explore the uh, the relationships between mental health and HIV, as many of the articles in this uh, special issue do so wonderfully. But I also think that if we want to frame the care of persons with HIV from a person-centered approach, then actually whether or not there is a direct biological link between HIV and mental health is actually not relevant to me at all. Um, if we value mental health as a fundamental uh, a, a quality issue for the well-being of an individual with HIV, uh, the fact that we should be addressing their mental health problems is something that stands independent of whether or not it actually affects the HIV course and trajectory. And so I think that sometimes we, we, we need to, to separate the value of mental health in and of itself from whether or not it affects HIV. So for example, when you see null results as we do in some of the, um, you know, in, in some of the analyses that were presented, um, you know, that's simply saying, okay, there's no association between mental health and HIV, but that doesn't make mental health any less important as an issue to address. A really important point. One other issue, uh, um, we're, we have multiple um, microepidemics around the world with different drivers. And to what extent uh, do some of the, um, relationships for being in key population, particularly in non-affirming societies, play a role in, in this, this process as well. Just curious if um, folks want to uh, delineate some of the differences between settings that may be more generalized, where the epidemic may be more generalized and some of the dynamics in places where um, the, um, the, the risk for acquiring HIV uh, may, may be um, stigmatized and how that stigma plays a role in uh, uh, behavioral mental health issues. Yeah, I mean, stigma is clearly important, and I I didn't get the question. <laughs> we've not we've not yet also brought up the social determinants of, of both, you know, both HIV and um, mental health problems, and certainly we found in our research in Zimbabwe that um, you know people have um, you know overwhelming social concerns. Um, Jennifer spoken about violence uh, and abuse, uh, poverty. Uh, and these are, you know, need to be looked at, as Vikram said, whether or not someone's living with HIV or not, they are fueling, though, both the, often the mental health problem and may have fueled the HIV risk right at the beginning. So um, it's really important um, that we, we are holistic and we do recognize um, the, the, the many vulnerabilities that our clients face. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. And just to piggyback off of that comment, I think what we're seeing in some of the now mental health interventions that we're looking at implementing in these settings is also trying to layer in economic empowerment interventions uh, and, and peer support components that don't necessarily have a mental health target, but could get at some of these social determinants of health, stigma, um, financial insecurity, and food insecurity that we know that young women are also facing in these same settings. Yeah, and Aldreda, so the, the, the point of the question was that uh, in, in some settings, uh, um, homophobia or um, transphobia may be playing a role. Uh, in other settings, uh, um, intimate partner violence or gender-based violence may be playing a role. So just um, wanted to make sure we're uh, having our um, listeners sort of think about sort of the larger array of things. And as Melanie said, some of the social determinants of health, which, you know, what... Um, Poverty, housing, and security may, may be playing a role too, and, and so the interventions have to sort of address more more than necessarily the individual level factors. So sometimes, yes, um, yes, uh, issues like homophobia, uh, uh, domestic violence, yes, they do fuel the um, HIV epidemic, as well as the mental health issues. So uh, in such circumstances, uh, 
there's going to be, you know, um, a high burden of both. And uh, of course, uh, um, mental health interventions have um, to be made accessible to those populations uh, uh, where um, homophobia is uh, playing a role in deterring uh, the provision of uh, mental health services to the LGBT community, for example. Um, uh, and we need uh, to get uh, mental health services to those communities because of the uh, sort of the, the double or triple stigma that they are facing uh, because of who they are. Thank you. Um, one very concrete question uh, here is, what are the best tools for depression and anxiety screening in youth? Um, anybody like to take that? That's a great question. Um, I can take a stab at it since our study was with adolescent girls. Um, we did use the CESD and found that it worked pretty well. I thought it worked better than I've used the PHQ-9 and um, a few other studies. And we've used some transdiagnostic uh, screening tools in other contexts. And in South Africa in particular, the CESD had been used in adolescent populations. So we were able to kind of build off of previous work that had been done um, and, and use it in our study. So I, I was happy with the selection of that screening tool, but I know that there are many and everyone kind of has their own, own uh, preference about it. So I might just add to that. Uh, I think one of the one of the challenges has been finding a, a measure, particularly for adolescents, that you know captures the very transdiagnostic nature as, as as Jen referred to, but also the fact that it's very dynamic, and these kind of diagnostic clusters that have traditionally dominated measurement uh, in adult mental health don't really apply very well to adolescents. So you might want to look out for the new tool that UNICEF is developing with the World Health Organization. It's a, it's a, my, my expectation is because it's backed by these two UN agencies and the Wellcome Trust, and that it will become the standard measure. Uh, it's going to also be used in the UNICEF's uh, multi-indicator childhood surveys uh, going forward. So uh, look out for the UNICEF webpage. I think it's called MMAP, uh, which will tell you more about the tool and its origins and its content. Great, no, thank you. Um, one other uh, question, uh, the role of spiritual-based resilience capacity building in addressing mental health challenges. Does anybody on the panel have any comments about that? I think it's a domain that is probably understudied because we certainly know that in many populations, um, um, religion and spirituality do play a key role um, in people's lives. Uh, but um, working that into uh, intervention development, I think there's still a lot of room. Ethel, Ethel Dredd, it looks like you have a comment. Yes, yes, I do. Um, yeah, that's a very um, interesting comment uh, there. Um, indeed, in our context, uh, religion and spirituality, they play a big role in people's lives. Uh, but also uh, when people have mental health problems, the tendency is to think it's a spiritual problem and they go to the spiritual uh, leaders or religious leaders or, or other faith leaders first. So this is what we've noticed in our setting. And right now we're having a dialogue between religious leaders and mental health professionals to see how we can work together uh, to bring mental health services to everybody. You know, according to the uh, World Mental Health Day theme this year, uh, mental health in an unequal world. And in Uganda, we are saying we don't want to leave anyone behind. So we are having dialogue with the religious leaders to see how we can collaborate uh, to work with them so that when uh, patients with mental health problems go to them, they also have some basic skills, some basic um, mental health skills with which they can use to help them. And then if they fail, they can refer. Uh, but we are realizing it's not uh, realistic for the mental health professionals to say, we know it all. And the religious leaders to also say, no, 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 we know it all. And we have a wall between the two of us. 
and you know there are calls for us to have a fence you know a fence where we can talk to each other across this fence and be better neighbors than what we are than what we are right now I want to jump in and just say, I think that's such an excellent, excellent point in the way you framed that, Ethel, because um, I think working in tandem and working together is really what is, in key, is key. It reminds me of kind of a parallel thing with, with a holistic approach to, to physical ailments and, and a medication or Western approach that I've seen what you're very, the thing you're talking about when they work together, the holistic healer along with the Western medicine healer working together, that speaks mm -hmm. to the community, speaks to the people and is the most effective Absolutely. paradigm. Absolutely. Thank you, and it's really an area deserving a lot more uh, research and investigation. So with that, I'd like to turn um, the panel over to my colleague, uh, our uh, Joint Editor uh, in Chief, uh, Annette Son, uh, to make some comments and wind us through. Thank you, Ken. And first of all, we want to thank our guest editors for the incredible job they did in pulling all of this, this special issue together. And also to our co-authors who are here with us today, as well as those who are not. And we've sent the link to you in the chat box to all our participants that you can access these 10 articles. And we will also be sending you information about the video from this session. But we have had so many people register to attend this. We've had a lot of questions. Unfortunately, we won't be able to get to all of them today. But I think this just reflects the intense interest in global mental health. And this is really something that uh, was the reason for why uh, Dr. Diane Rausch, Dr. Pim Browers from NIMH championed this special issue and worked with us at the journal to make sure it happened. So we would encourage you as we are thinking about Global Mental Health Day and about the incredible pressures that we've all been facing because of the COVID pandemic about what Dr. Vikram said about how mental health is important whether or not it changes somebody's experience with their HIV treatment or their viral suppression, uh, whether or not it impacts their alcohol misuse. But all of these things are important for how we look at people living with HIV, people living with mental health disorders. And I guess before we close, I'd like to ask our guest editors for a final word, uh, Dr. Patel, Dr. Vikram. Thanks a lot. I think, uh, well, you know, it's hard to make a final word on such a fascinating issue as well as a great discussion. But one thing I will end with is that, you know, where does this take us, this body of evidence? And I'd like to suggest that the future of interventions move away from silos that separate mental health from the social determinants of health and the behavioral factors that affect HIV care. And I would imagine the future generation of interventions will really combine all of these so that a single group of providers can address all of these issues that are so deeply interconnected in a person-centered way. Thank you. And Dr. Melanie? Thanks, Annette. I think that um, what this work is doing and what you've done through this supplement is really encourage people in African countries to really think about the issues that their clients are facing um, and to, to be more you know, empowered to, to go out there and do research for themselves with support of organizations like NIMH, Wellcome Trust and so on. So I think there's a great turning point, um, a real move for much more African-led research, and that is very, very welcome. And Dr. Bremian. Uh, thank you, thank you, Annette. Um, I couldn't agree more with both of my colleagues, and so I'll, I'll say ditto to what they both said. I think the theme being um, interdisciplinary, integration, community-based, teamwork, working together um, approach is really what's needed here. And we, you know, I, I'll say this one final thing. We here are talking about integration of mental health, behavioral health, care and treatment and well-being into all of HIV primary care. I think that should be true across the board for all of primary care, for mental health in its own right, and the true integration of connecting the brain with the body, physical and mental health together. Excellent. Thank you all very much. And with that, I think we'll close this session. Thank you all. Thank you, our participants, and we look forward to seeing you at the next symposium. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Thanks, everyone.